Okay, well, this is really awesome. Thanks all for being here. I feel pretty honored to be in your presence. <laughs> Thank you for asking us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you guys about experiences at King. So, Jean, I'll start with you. Mm -hmm. What are some of your favorite mo memories and moments at King 5? Well, I guess my first favorite memory is getting hired here. <laughs> <laughs> There weren't any um, local television anchor women anywhere in the country that I knew about, but if you're in that spot at the time, you don't think about that. You just think, can I get this job? Can I do this job? Why'd they give me this job? You know, it was just a lucky break, really lucky timing, lucky break. Are there any memorable stories that you did in particular, maybe a top two? Oh my gosh. I got to interview a lot of sitting presidents. Some of them were standing, some of them were sitting. <laughs> but most of them that we all recall, you know, in our lives. And some of them are just very commonplace people. Some of them were, they seemed um, just like regular Joes. Lori, what are some of your favorite memories of King Five? Like Jean, I think being hired at King Five was a terrific honor because King Five was the big tamale in the market, right? We were the ones that you wanted to work at, and so that was a real thrill. Um, you were talking about some of the most memorable stories. I think my most memorable story was following then Governor Gary Locke on his first trade mission to China and the visit to his little ancestral village. It was 10 days of exhausting work, but it was really quite fulfilling because we got to go everywhere the governor went, including um, into Beijing to see the president of China. Joyce, what about you? And don't tell me it was when you got hired. <laughs> <laughs> it actually was, but I'm just taking in these two legends. Jean has been to Russia. Lori talks about going to China. I went to the Super Bowl. <laughs> yes. One of my big stories. I have never actually interviewed a sitting president on my bucket list. Still could happen, potentially. Um, but it honestly is getting hired because being from the Northwest, I grew up watching King Five. My dream job literally was to work at King Five someday. And so I started within the King family at Krem TV in Spokane, but then I went to North Carolina. And when I got the call to come here to interview, I just couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really was like a dream that came true for me. So coming into this newsroom um, and then being able to have a career within the family that is King Five, it really is the best thing that ever. We're it glad was, you came. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm glad I'm still here. <laughs> it was truly a historic time, you know, Jean being the first, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. regular weeknight anchor woman in the nation, okay, right, right here at King. And then at a time when there weren't that many women in television news. And then the d increasing diversity on King 5. Okay, oh wow, they're going to have an Asian American woman be on the anchor disc, and they're going to have an African American woman on the anchor disc. It was a time of change, and we were kind of right in the middle of it, um, kind of thrust into that role of being a role model, being a leader. And I don't know about you gals, but I was like not expecting to be a leader. It was just something okay. you kind of did. Kind of and remember, I came on the heels of Hattie Kaufman, who was the first Native American woman, I think, on television in the country, also at King. So for me, there was never an idea that I didn't think I could do it because I had so many examples ahead of me of women like Jean who were already doing it. So it was never in my mind that it was something I couldn't do. It was well, just, when am I going to have my and opportunity? Now we have Jessica Jenner Castro, right? <laughs> a Latina. Yeah, yeah. I, think I mean, look at look at this. I think this um, uh, Bert told me I think I'm the first Latina anchor for King Five. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty pretty cool to follow in your guys' footsteps. <laughs> Let me ask you about that though. Was there a sense of camaraderie because you know you were sharing in a way this experience of you know holding the torch and kind of passing it along and and being these like really powerful women at King Five? I would say 100% yeah, totally. But we follow a really amazing woman. Right. I mean, the founder of King was Dorothy Bullitt. Right. And at the time when the station started and when all of us came to work, it was still relatively small. And King was a leader in the community in so many ways, on the air and in the community. And she kind of led the way. And she looked after us. And she, I think she gave us a lot of support in all the things that we did. Um, uh, you know, we were probably the first anchor people to have babies, not like having 
to hide them under the desk was my recollection. Like, oh, yeah. oh my gosh, this woman is pregnant. Let's hide her under the desk. <laughs> and then gradually now people hold the babies up and say, here's my baby. Is my yeah. baby beautiful? But you think about all the firsts that we were part of. Mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out child care and have children at home and trying to figure out work-life balance and make it useful for the next people to come through the station. There's no maternity leave when I was in maternity. So it's, it's, I mean, it's getting better. It's not perfect yet, but it's getting better for everybody who's trying to find a balance between their work and their, and their lives. You said when you were hired at King and you became the first female weekday news anchor in the country that you were just kind of going along. You didn't, you know, maybe realize at the time the importance that would have and the weight that would have. Looking back on it, what would you say to your younger self? Well, that's such an interesting question. Uh, I would say be more confident. Um, I always thought, oh gosh, when they look at me or hear my voice, they're going to fire me for sure. <laughs> but I would say to uh, uh, my younger self and, it, and anybody who feels a lack of confidence, believe that you can do it and you will be able to do it. That I think hope is, a, is like a muscle and you have to grow that muscle and you have to grow that confidence. It might not come naturally to you, but believe that you can do it and work really hard to make it happen. And can you believe now, looking back, that you were the first? And um, sure, I believe it now because um, you know I, I get it. But at the time, honestly, you're not thinking about that. You're thinking about going to work and getting your job done, and going home and getting dinner on the table. You're thinking about all the things everybody thinks about. You don't think about, oh, this is a big deal. You're the first. You think about, I want to do a really good job. Mm -hmm. And I think a really good job in King's background was you work really hard to produce a story that's truthful, which may take a long time, not just mm -hmm. one day. And then you re work really hard in the community to be a problem solver or be a, a helper in the community. So I think Mrs. Bullock sort of set us on our way saying, we're in a business and, you're, and you know, sponsors keep us in business. So there was that on one hand. But on the other hand, you're licensed to do public service. You're licensed in the public interest. So serve the public. And service isn't something you do at the end of your life. It's something you do all your life. Mm -hmm. And she sort of set us up that way. And there's so many people. Joyce has done Plymouth Housing for 20 years. Mm -hmm. and Lori's brought an understanding of the Asian American community to everybody for dozens of years. I mean, she set us up to do a, a wide range of things, not just report the news. On that note, I want to ask Lori about, you know, you really are a pillar in the community, especially the Asian American community in Western Washington. And you've been honored for your work overseas and like the bridge that you've, you know, you've made with like Asian communities. How much weight is that on your shoulders? <laughs> and, and you know, what did you feel when you got those honors? I think viewers have to remember that at the time I was starting out, there weren't that many reporters of color on television. And so it was really incumbent on me, I felt, to kind of advocate for all the young people that were coming up behind me. OK, I got a job, but my job is to pull everybody forward. And so I was very active in getting minority journalists hired. And so I did that basically through the Asian American Journalists Association. And I would go up to news directors that I didn't even know and say, hey, you ought to be hiring more people of color, journalists of color. And they would say, well, I would, but where are they? Mm -hmm. So that was a challenge. And I don't give up when someone throws a challenge like that. And I said, well, OK, we're going to prime the pump. We're going to get these young people to go to college, stay in college, and we're going to mentor them. And then you'll have all the journalists to pick from. We're going to prime the pump, and you will have journalists of color coming at you from all directions. And that was kind of like the mission for the next few years, for the next few decades. Just prime the pump and let them loose. And what you see today is basically the result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and That's I feel great. like we have a lot of people of color on our air. I mean, we could have more, but mm -hmm. we certainly have a lot. And that's the thing. It didn't <laughs> start out that way. It was mostly white guys sitting on the news set. And now it has changed, and for the better, I think. When Good. you got recognized for that work in the community, how did you feel? I felt so thrilled that uh, people appreciated it because it was a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And there's a fine line. You can't be too much of an advocate. You can't be too out there. But like Jean said, you just have to believe in what you're doing and, and just go for it. 
Joyce, tell me what motivates you and what keeps you going. You are so active in the community. You are such a big role model. And to the people inside the newsroom currently, which I think sometimes, you know, maybe you don't recognize or realize, but I think everyone looks up to you. So what keeps you going? Well, I was listening to what Jean said about confidence, which I didn't have a lot of when I was first hired, but I was surrounded by all of these veterans who really pulled me along. Uh, so I wish I would tell my younger self to be more confident, but I honestly feel not really the same kind of weight that Lori talked about. I feel a responsibility to just do my best every day so that I can set an example for people who are watching our broadcast so that they will say, if she can do it, I can do it. Uh, that's sort of the weight that I feel, that I just need to show up every day and just do my best whatever it is. I think that we can't take it for granted that the audience will always trust that we're telling the truth or we're, that you know they can believe what we're saying. And I, so I think that Stand for Truth, King's motto is super important, especially um, in social media today where it's mm -hmm. difficult to tell what's truthful. Yeah. I remember w Mrs. Bullitt once sent, sent me to China with the crew and she said, I said, what's the mission? What do you want us to do in China? She just said, go find the truth. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no problem. Such a broad assignment. <laughs> but really, that's the rest of what we do, um, you know, in this job. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe in a day, or maybe in months, or maybe over years, but that's our job. One thing yeah. I learned was that uh, you, they are, people are watching all the time. And so you never know when you're going to make an impact on someone. And so I just ran into a young man who said, you came to our you know, fifth grade class and mm -hmm. gave a talk about incarceration. And that got me inspired to buy books, children's books about the incarceration for other elementary schools. And here's this young man in high school saying this. So you, know, you never know what right. kind of an impact you're gonna have on mm -hmm. anyone. So you always have to do your best. You always have to be true. And you always have to you know, think that you know, this is for the next generation. Right. This is for those coming behind. You, you asked about our camaraderie. Mm -hmm. And one thing I can say is that we've never been competitive, right? I th feel like we've always been supportive of one another, for sure. Jean's supportive of us and mm -hmm. vice versa. But I remember early on really recognizing that I wasn't not competing or even trying to be like. That mm -hmm. word authenticity, mm -hmm rings true, I think, for each of us, that I think what has worked for King and for all of us is that I wasn't trying to be Lori or trying to be Jean. I maybe model Jean mm -hmm. and, and, and Lori in some ways, but that m the best road for success for me was going to be just to be me. Yeah. And I tell young people, yeah. you are enough. Right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that makes you you, that is enough for whatever you're going to do. Don't try to be like or sound mm -hmm. like or talk like anyone yeah. else just be you mm -hmm. and be proud of that one of the best pieces of advice i got was from mrs bullet's daughter patsy collins because when mrs bullet kind of let go of the reins her two daughters mm -hmm. kind of took over mm -hmm. and they were a whole, a forces in the in their own right so patsy collins said um, always remember that god gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason <laughs> because you're supposed to listen twice as hard as as you spend time speaking Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that's really good advice. And then somebody else said, um, don't just look, but really see the other person. Mm -hmm. and, and the person who said this said, that is the hardest darn thing to do, to not just look, but really see, which means, I guess, to look with all your senses. You know? I like that. And Those, listening's also hard. Yeah. You know, it's hard. really <laughs> listening. Right. Not just listening, but really hearing mm -hmm. what people are mm -hmm. telling you. Laurie? Someone just the other day asked, um, what is the most important piece of advice you have? And I said, well, the most important question you can ask someone you're interviewing is, and then what? <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be amazed at what comes forth. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you cannot enter an interview thinking, I know everything that this right. person is going to tell me. You'll mm -hmm. never know. So you have to ask that question. My advice for young women is, uh, you have a story. You are important. Your perspective is necessary. It's needed. So don't be afraid to share it. Mm -hmm. Jean. Oh, I would say for women and for men who want to work in journalism, um, or, or actually for any work, is figure out what you're passionate about. 
because in your life you're going to work really hard. You're going to spend a lot of hours and put in a lot of um, difficult moments. And so be passionate about what you do and keep your eye on that. I'm doing this because I really believe in, you know, in our case, finding a story, representing people in that story, tell their story, but be passionate about it. Um, otherwise, it's going to seem like harder work than it really is. And um, Jean, I think you said this, once a journalist, always a journalist. <laughs> so Ask my friends. <laughs> <laughs> she has so many questions. <laughs> you just sent us story ideas two days ago. <laughs> um, how much is King Five and being a journalist ingrained in you? Um, um, well, you know, or people say, did you always want this job? I didn't because, again, like we all said, you couldn't aspire to it. You couldn't see anybody that looked like you until each one of you came along and then somebody looked like you. Um, I just um, was lucky. There are a lot of lucky accidents out of college. I got a really good job writing editorials. Um, and I just kept on, kept on going. But I think I'm a really curious, a person full of curiosity and energy. and. Um, I'm trying to find opportunities or follow luck or whatever, but I think that um, curiosity is at the base of what we do. Like yeah. you said, ask the question, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> so everybody has a story. I walk around Green Lake sometimes and I look at people coming the other way and I go, that guy's got a story. I right. know that guy yeah. has a story, but I can't talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Lori, what about you? How much is King Five a part of you? King Five is an amazing part of my life, even to this day. I mean, I can't really walk into a grocery store or anything without someone saying, Lori, as yeah. if like we're old friends, and it's just someone who's seen me on TV all the time. So it means that I always have to wear makeup, I can't wear, you know, grungy clothes. I always have to kind of like be dressed because I still feel like I represent King Five. So, you know, I'm, I'm still there in spirit and in body for now. <laughs> you know, I'm the opposite. I go out without any makeup on <laughs> and my Lululemons and Ugg slippers, right? Just, yeah. I, I take it as, in fact, I remember my very first TV job in the King family at Creme. After two or three weeks of feeling like I had to put makeup on every day, I thought, I can't do this. I, I, I'm just not going to be able to keep this up. And so I just stopped. And, and now I probably should wear makeup more when I go out. Even my kids would say sometimes, Mommy, just a little bit. <laughs> Lipstick, um, please. Right. Um, but uh, I forgot the question, Jess. Honestly. Oh, it was how much of, of oh, King Five is a yeah. part of you? I mean, I know you're still working. And so. Right. So that also changes the equation. I mean, you're here every day. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm sure that whenever you go to the yeah. store, I know I've been with you, and people say, oh my gosh, Joyce, and you were there. I remember when you interviewed me at the you know, Kingdom or whatever, right? Like, you're a part of people's so, lives. I've spent more than half of my life with the King Five family. And as an anchor who now is finally sitting in the chair that Jean warmed up for all of us. Um, I feel a huge responsibility, not just about protecting the legacy that is King Five that Dorothy Bullitt started and all of these women carried on, but I worry a little bit about, so who, who's going to be next after me? I mean, my window's shrinking, right? And so I have a, a couple of years left, three or four or whatever. So I think a lot about who's sort of in the pipeline, women like you, Who's going to come after me, like I came after Lori and Jean? Uh, I, I think a lot about the legacy. Why is legacy important to you? I feel a huge responsibility, a sense of responsibility. I mean, it's a privilege to work in journalism. It's been a privilege to work mm -hmm. at King Five and to be part of the story that is King's story. Um, but to me, there is no more important profession than journalism. It's protected, the only job protected in the Constitution. And so the legacy, to carry on that legacy, I think is critical for our democracy. Um, on a lighter note, for Lori and Jean, are you guys watching King Five? Or are you going, <laughs> oh, I would have done that differently. Or, that lighting is that no lighting good. Wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> or, or are you like, are you just she like, not be I, that. <laughs> still watching King Five. That's how I learned about King Five News at Five with Joyce Taylor. I'm going, oh my God, she's on the... Yeah, she's got her own program. But I, I just love, we were talking about legacy. I think it's so important that our viewers and people 
pay attention to programs like this, to books about King Five's legacy, because you appreciate where we've come. Because it started as a small TV station owned by a pioneering woman, oh my goodness, and then it was staffed by these people, and then it was staffed by these people, and these were the stories they were covering. If you don't appreciate and learn about the past, you'll never really know what you have. So I think, I hope people do pay attention to legacy and history because then you'll appreciate what you'll have and you'll fight for it and you'll protect it. Mm -hmm. Really good point, really good point. I think legacy is important because if, if what is at the heart of King's legacy is telling the truth and seeking the truth and recognizing it doesn't come on a plate, every day sometimes it's hard to find it and it takes weeks and weeks of digging I mean look at the investigators mm -hmm. at King talk about legacy um, digging and digging to find the truth in a story and so recognizing it's hard work it's important work mm -hmm. uh, it's worthwhile work and sometimes it's lots of fun <laughs> lots and lots of fun the first show that King did 75 years ago was a football game and I'm thinking about the recent Husky football game where the entire field was covered with people dressed in purple and the game was over. It was an epic game. And this King's 75th anniversary is right around the time of Thanksgiving, 75 years ago, with our first football game. And there will be more. There will be the yeah. Apple Cup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then talk about a lighter note. I mean, I feel like football, sometimes in our house it means too much. But <laughs> sometimes I think it's just a great, joyful, fun, and escape. And everybody loves to have a team yeah. and talk to your family. and. I'm on the phone with my brother all the time. Are you watching the Hawks? Are you watching the Hus? Of course I am, because mm -hmm. it's fun. It's fun. So it's not everything that we do at King, you do at King, is not all hard work. Some of it is really, really fun. And some of the people you get to work with are really, really fun. Yes. I think mm -hmm. about sitting on the set at dinner time every night for 25 years with Dennis Bounds and <laughs> Paul Sylvie and Jeff Renner. And I mean, I felt so, so lucky. Yeah that this was my TV family. Mm -hmm. And hopefully people in the community thought, okay, that really, they are like family. Mm -hmm. I, that's part of the legacy too. Yeah. Unless you have any hard questions, I do have some fun ones I wanted <laughs> to ask. Um, funny hard ones, the only question that I had that I was thinking of is, I am relatively new to King 5 and I've been learning so much about the 75 year history in the archive room, and digging up all the old programs and looking at celebrate the differences and the, Soviet Russia coverage. What's one project that you were part of at King that felt really personal and unique to you? Mm. Well, I can answer that one. Okay. I mean, you, so you mentioned the, the Soviet coverage, and at the time of the Cold War, King got this wizard idea to do what was technologically breakthrough at the time, which was what we called the space bridge, where you send a message up to a satellite and it comes down in Moscow, and they send one up to the satellite and it comes down in Seattle. Now it's every day. Live shots are every day from everywhere. But then it wasn't, it was brand new technology. And we lined up, we had a partner team in Russia and we lined up um, students on both sides of the globe, uh, parents on both sides of the globe, teachers on both sides of the globe. And the object of the project was to show that wherever you're from, you have some similar aims. I want my family to grow up with peace and security and I want to have a solid family. And I just think, is there, um, an opportunity to do something like that today, to get a bridge between and among communities where there doesn't seem to be a bridge to peace. And I just think that was one of the best projects I was ever part of, and I think somebody could conceive of a project like that that would be useful today. Can't you please? <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel a sense of accomplishment after that? Yeah, it was yeah. great. It was great. Um, I think another another project that the King was really proud of and that the community, I think, respected King's leadership was starting the first AIDS walk. Uh, in the early 80s when people were afraid mm -hmm. to find out what AIDS was or afraid to talk to somebody or help somebody who had AIDS, King was a leader in the community to say, this is not just, um, Th this is a humanitarian issue, this is a medical issue, and we're going to take a leadership position. And the head of King got together with a bunch of other company heads to all go all in on this and sort of turn the conversation to how can we help? How can we solve this crisis? And I mean, you see that 40 years later, um, AIDS is something that people live with yeah. and something that people 
don't think it's necessarily a scourge or something you're going to die from. Um, it's it's a manageable issue in our in our lives today. Mm -hmm. Laura, you mentioned the trip with Gary Locke, but is okay. there anything else that comes to mind? Uh, I'm thinking about things that made a difference for me here at King. The trip, the trade mission with Gary Locke was definitely one of them. Going with King 5 teams to the Olympics <laughs> is another one. I went to Salt Lake City and I went to Vancouver, <coughs> BC. And it's just wonderful to be able to highlight local athletes at these international games. It's, it's such a thrill, but it's a wonderful experience for our audience. And I think the audience just loves seeing their local people doing so well. And then the last thing, speaking of legacy, I felt like I couldn't even retire from King unless I did something definitive for the archives about the Japanese American incarceration. It was the 70th anniversary of that incarceration order, Executive Order 9066. And so we did a full on series and a special on the incarceration experience because it started here, Bainbridge Island, Washington, first people to go. And so I feel like working on that significant project, which actually led to my first Emmy ever <laughs> at the end of my that. career. Um, but it was uh, something that I could like put in the archival box and say, here, Seattle, here's something definitive that you can rely on and you can refer to. And it's part of your history and legacy. So mm. that was probably it. Yeah, that probably felt highly personal to yeah. you. Yeah. Joyce? So I've had the opportunity to cover amazing stories, to go to the White House to cover an inauguration, to go to two Super Bowls, mm -hmm. to the White House with um, the Seahawks, where I got to see President Obama, but I didn't get to speak to him. But the one project I am most proud of, and Jean talked a little bit about being seen, mm -hmm. um, was the project we did around facing race, mm -hmm. where you know, usually some a major event would happen George Floyd's death would happened, and then Ahmaud Aubrey was killed. There were, there were a slew of African Americans who were killed at the hands of police in a short period of time. And I think most people look at me as somebody who's unscathed or part of the community, but somehow not impacted by some of the stories that we cover, when in fact we all are, right? And so um, doing 13 episodes at that period of time. I was so proud to be part of that, but mostly I was so thrilled that King recognized that mm -hmm. a town hall wasn't enough, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we needed to really peel back some of these issues around race and policing and misunderstanding and what it means to be a person of color in this community and really talk about some of those issues that are hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd been here a long time, and I had pitched some of these stories for many, many years, um, falling on deaf ears because we have so many different other issues to, co to cover. But I'm most proud, I think, of the work that we did around that, mostly because it was the idea of leadership, and they were fully committed and supportive in every way. Jean was talking about community. And one thing I do think that is so much part of King's legacy um, that I hope continues is when we were all hired, Community and the job were hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You didn't do one without the other. It was an expectation that you did a certain amount of community service. It just came with the job. If you work here, this is also it's part of it. It goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I worry that a, a newer generation of journalists coming in, they see them as separate things. But really, for me, working at King means you do community service. Mm -hmm. That is part of being in the community, mm -hmm. being a journalist in the community, and carrying on the legacy that was started. Mm -hmm. They go hand in hand. They always have. And it's not demanded of you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an unspoken. Right. If you work here, it's part of what you do here. Mm -hmm. So, right. yeah, yeah, I think our hope is that people coming in in the future will carry on and will sense that mm -hmm. that duty, if you will. An because opportunity, really. Right. To it serve is. in a different way. Yeah. Right. And to give back in a different way and yeah. to be part of the community that we serve. I'm going to ask way. my version of Lori's question of, and then what? <laughs> but um, my version is, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want to mention, um, especially regarding the 75th anniversary and the legacy of King Five, 
or women here at King Five, the trailblazing women, the queens of King? We've all raised kids and done this job, mm -hmm. and it wasn't easy. Was it, Jean? Um, it's, I always felt like if it wasn't going really well at King that day, let's hope it goes really well at King. <laughs> I mean, at home. If it's not going really well at home that day, let's hope it goes better at King. But a bad situation in both places is always a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> it's still true. <laughs> yeah, I, I've always admired that because it's not, it wasn't easy to have two small kids and work the morning show. I, but I watched Lori raise her son, I watched Jean raise her girls and juggle this job and give back to the community in a huge way. And so that was helpful for me to be I, able to you know, it's not, it. It's not just women too, because one of the changes we've seen, I think we've all seen over the last mm -hmm. few years, is that men really pitch in. You know, whoever your partner is, they really pitch in, um, much more so than historically. So it doesn't rest on just one person's shoulders, although one person may shoulder most of it. I think it's it's on, mm -hmm. you know, as they say, it takes a community. It's it's there's a realization that there's a lot of people that make it all happen, make the job go well, make the home life go well, make your work in the community go well. I think what I hoped people carry out from this is that we hope our children appreciated what we did for them. <laughs> it was so. very difficult. It was. it was challenging, and it's telling that. Our son chose not to go into television news because he says, are you crazy? That is such hard work. Um, but I, I hope people get, get a sense of uh, appreciation and gratefulness, gratitude from what uh, their moms and dads did for them. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's my hope is that the future will be hopeful uh, and that we, we did a good job kind of bringing along the next generation. You did. <laughs> you did. I think we all admire you guys and the work you've put in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else? That's it. It's just such a treat. I know. I, know. Really yeah, I, I feel like, like we could talk for another three hours. <laughs> but I'm watching these two go like this in my peripheral, and I'm like, oh, maybe we should wrap it up here in the studio. <laughs> when did the three of us all have an hour together, plus Jessica? I mean, never. Maybe never. never. Like, never. Never. Yeah. Because everyone's know, on a different show. Yeah, they're on different, right? still so busy. You're so busy.